All right, hello everybody, and thank you for joining us on a Thursday at 3 p.m. for what I promise you will be a riveting discussion about global regulation and cryptocurrencies, if the quality of the commentary in the speaker green room was anything to go by. Um, I'm gonna start with a very brief round of introductions just to sort of set the stage on the folks that you will hear from today, what their various interests of interest and in some cases disagreement might be. And at the end, we will have some time for questions. At that point, I will be that person who says, please actually ask a question and not merely make a comment on the state of the world. And I'll also ask you to stand up just so that our colleagues who are providing the live stream for this will be able to include you in those shots. Um, I'm just gonna start with the gentleman closest to me. Klaus Knott, you are here in two capacities, at least for this particular panel. You are the chair of the FSB, which has very important roles to play in the context of opining on financial stability and persuading people that this is an important thing for our overall financial ecosystem. And you are, of course, president of the Central Bank of the Netherlands. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and immediately following, we have Commissioner Marie McGuinness, who is um, challenging portfolio, just I think in terms of scope, uh, financial services, financial stability, and the, the capital markets. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Brad, you have perhaps the shortest title, Garling House. You are the CEO of Ripple Labs. <laughs> but you have, I think, one of the more complex interactions with some of the regulators that we will be discussing about today. So we will certainly be hearing from that. And last but not least, we have His Excellency Omar Sultan Al Ulama, who is representing the UAE. And again, very interesting portfolio that encompasses remote work, artificial intelligence, and digital assets, all of which are hot topics here in Davos. So. Thank you everyone for joining us. Now, if you have been to any of the other sessions recently, you may have heard any of the following words. Sam Bankman-Fried, um, Bitcoin, tokenization, digital assets, stable coins, fraud, scams, hype, excessive exuberance, and regulation. And we will tackle if I manage this time correctly, most if not all of those things. And I want to start by acknowledging that at the time of this panel, we are in an environment in which if folks have heard about crypto and crypto assets and if they have an opinion on it, it tends to be one of two reasonably polarized things. Best idea of all time, worst thing ever. And the spectrum of opinions here on this stage is neither of those, right? What we are gonna talk about is the, the messy and much more interesting middle, which is given the existence of a set of underlying technologies known as the blockchain and the existence of an entire ecosystem from centralized exchanges to banks that work with those exchanges to companies dedicated to providing services in that universe, what is the appropriate role of regulation here? And Your Excellency, I'd like to start with you because the UAE has over the past several years emerged as a jurisdiction with what is described as a lighter touch approach to digital asset regulation. Can you just give a sense of what that is and why? Thank you, Stacey. It's an absolute pleasure being with all of you here today. I was promised one ripple to be on this panel. So uh, Brad's Brad gonna yes. uh, share that. But um, in all honesty, I think the first and foremost thing that I want to describe is the UAE's um, uh, let's say journey with crypto started in 2015. We hosted the first round table where we just wanted to actually understand what this is and understand if it's worth regulating or not. At that point of time, let's say the adoption was quite low and people were still not sure what the utility was. So we thought, let's follow it, but let's not regulate it at this point of time. Today, uh, our regulations are actually not lighter than most other jurisdictions. We have very extensive regulations, but um, maybe it's not promoted as um, you'd like on, on most platforms. Let's talk about, for example, VARA. We've heard that FTX is a license. Can you say what VARA is? So virtual, so we have a, sorry, we have an authority in the UAE called the Virtual Assets Regulation Authority. And um, through that, people have heard that FTX and Binance and some of these other platforms were licensed. But the fact of the matter is we don't have a single license exchange in the UAE. What we have is a four-step process. The first is called a provisional MVP license for these exchanges to come and open up their activities for us to understand exactly what they are, if there's any fraudulent activity internally. Does this actually check out as a business? Is there anything that the government needs to uh, really dig in uh, to? 
And then they go through something called an operational MVP license, which goes and looks at their operations, goes and sees, for example, do they enforce uh, KYC and AML measures. Know your customer and anti-money laundry. Yes, know your customer and anti-money laundry as well. And then finally, they're actually given something called a full um, market product, FMP, which allows them to bring in customers. So not a single exchange in the UAE was able to onboard any customers, um, even until last week. Now, I would like, the, for the European perspective here, just for a second, that is by the kind of the framework of MICA, which is wending its way through the process, seems still, even if it's not necessarily lighter touch, in a lot of ways, much more focused on like exchanges in one particular part of the market. Commissioner McGuinness, can you just talk a little bit about what the markets and crypto assets regulation is trying to propose and how it may be similar to or different from the approach of other countries and states? Well, we started work on this before my arrival into my role. So there was a concern that this existed. So in one sense, we had three options. Let it happen without, so, so turn a blind eye, ban it, or regulate. Uh, so at this stage, the market in crypto assets has gone through all the legislative process. It's not just implemented yet, but it is coming. And the idea is that a license is granted to these operators, which is across them, the member states, or, uh, they can operate across the member states. But really, in my view, regulation is about knowing what's happening out there, um, understanding that there can be checks and balances so that we don't just say we're regulating, we then actively do that. And I think the recent experience Experience um, of uh, those uh, dramatic events in the whole crypto area has reassured us that we're doing the right thing and that I would like to implement soon, and we will. Um, I think beyond that, uh, it was interesting your observation about technology. So I want to be very clear that there is a difference between technology and how it is used. Um, so we're also conscious that we don't want to stifle innovation. So we, we have in already some uh, pilot projects around DLT. Uh, but Distributed we don't ledger technology. I'm just going to explain acronyms I have to say, today. you're <laughs> passing all of the tests. So well done. Uh, so my apologies for that. I used to be like this. It gets to you after a while. So we have actually, um, you know, we're doing the right thing around trying not to stifle innovation, but not having, as we say, a wild west. And again, I want to go back to the real world which are the people out there, not in this room, who invested, like the youngsters on apps. We all have young people in our households. This is happening before we even knew it. Lots of people have suffered for what has happened now. So while the consequences may not be immediate for financial stability, for individual stability, both financial and mental health, this can be very dangerous. So the idea of something always going up, we know does not exist. But if nobody ever tells you that and you're quite young and you're, you dabble a little and then you dabble more and then you borrow to dabble in all of this, that is a hugely damaging societal issue. So I think that in one sense where we are today, because of recent events, uh, which we would all rather didn't happen, people will be more aware of the downside. And that's one of the upsides of recent events. Um, and I think then beyond that, but it's probably too early to throw it in at this stage, is none of us really know where digitalization, uh, tokenization uh, will bring us. Mm -hmm. And we need to be mindful uh, to do it a step-by-step -step basis and watch very carefully on each of those steps. Chair Kinnett, in October 2018, you delivered a speech that was titled The Evolution of Power of the Blockchain, which is a very early period to be giving such a speech on. But one of the things that you identified in there was that a concern about the potential intersections between traditionally regulated financial institutions and crypto assets. And you even made the point that regulators don't like the phrase cryptocurrencies because crypto is not money. Um, <laughs> can you talk about what the potential risks are. You know, we've heard about the need for consumer protection. We've heard about the importance of know your customer and anti-money and anti laundering. We have had in the United States, for example, Silvergate Bank experience a multi-billion dollar run on the bank, um, in part because of its exposure to FTX. It laid off 40% of its staff. It was able to tap a federally provided lending reserve that is only available to banks but not to crypto companies. You know, so even if we have CEOs like Jamie Dimon out there saying, I think his latest is, Bitcoin is hyped up fraud, there are other banking CEOs who are clearly interested in playing in this area. 
Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much also for having me. Uh, if I had been offered a Ripple, by the way, then I would probably have had to decline I, well, I the invitation. Right. I think they mean uh, XRP, not but, Ripple. Uh, Ripple's <laughs> the company, XRP's the token. Good. <laughs> yes. Anyway, but um, on, uh, let me begin also by saying that the FSB also has a sort of single punchline <laughs> for digital innovation, and that is uh, trying to harness the benefits of innovation while mitigating the risks. I must say, though, that over the last year or so, we have been so busy with this latter part of the this front line, <laughs> the risk mitigation part, that clearly there has been less attention on the tables that I uh, join on, uh, on harnessing uh, the benefits part. But I guess that's also the role that you expect from uh, a global community of regulators to play. Now, like Commissioner McGuinness, I would also say that many of the risks that we've seen in the last few months are not all that different from risks that we also saw elsewhere in the financial system in earlier episodes. Uh, they have a long, long, long history of the financial boom-bust cycles, etc. The difference this time is that they appear in a digital mm -hmm. manifestation. But essentially, this is about liquidity mismatches, which makes some of the, these platforms uh, vulnerable to runs. It is about creating expectations of ever-increasing prices, which are, of course, too good to be true. We know it. Um, there are the dangers of leverage. Uh, uh, people taking speculative bets. Well, you can't stop them from doing it, but speculative bets do turn into a financial stability risk if they're leveraged bets. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what you want to avoid as much uh, as, uh, as, as, as possible. And then, of course, there have been all these kinds of interconnections within the crypto space that have raised serious issues about governance, about conflicts the of The rediscovery interest, of counterparty risk. The rediscovery of counterparty risk, uh, etc. So our effort has been on the scale of banning, isolating slash containing uh, traditional incentives-based regulation to, of course, uh, uh, come up with a regime where all three elements need to be uh, part of it when it comes to illicit activities where unfortunately too often crypto assets do play an important role in the financing of money laundering mm -hmm. of drug trafficking of illegal arms trading etc that is clearly areas where you find them where i think bans are appropriate mm -hmm. isolating slash containing that is where you try to keep at least that those parts of the traditional financial sector where leverage plays a huge role away from cryptos as far as possible uh, to contain what I spoke about in 2018, the possible sort of contagion effects from the crypto world to the more traditional, traditionally regulated parts of the financial system. And then, yes, you have the normal incentive-based regulations, which are, again, not all that different. Uh, they are same activity, same risk, same regulation. Investor protection, transparency, separation of funds, uh, all these kinds of things. And the business is global in nature. Mm -hmm. Many of these crypto assets are uh, offered from places that I would call sunny places for shady people. Um, Could you give an example? Well, uh, <laughs> I think we all know uh, the, the kind of locations that we, where, that we are talking about. So we need to have a global framework to regulate this. It doesn't make sense to just have national approaches. I think this is mm. truly global, uh, global in nature. And so we have been working concretely, and then I'll stop, uh, on updating our uh, regulations on global stablecoin arrangements mm -hmm. and coming forward with a new set of uh, recommendations for what we call unbacked crypto assets or other crypto assets. They are now in the open for consultation. So we are huh, looking forward very much for sort of the response. It's the first pitch of the panel, people. Yeah, um, <laughs> and then we hope to finalize these two sets of recommendations by the summer of this year. Now, Brad, you have already made the distinction between XRP, the token, and Ripple, the company. You are the only... You're, you're a regulated entity, or you're speaking on behalf of a regulated entity. When folks talk about, you know, these different sorts of provisions, you are the person or your various teams doing the paperwork, providing evidence of baseline trustworthiness. What, it, what is it like to be a non-bank financial services pr provider operating at the intersection of these very traditionally regulated financial institutions and less traditionally regulated, less traditional financial institutions? It's exciting. Uh, I, like, I feel a obligation to you know, advocate for 
th there are these new technologies that we can use for the betterment of economic value to our citizens, to our businesses, even to central banks. And I think to the extent we can focus on, hey, these are new technologies that can be used in that way. Like the earliest days of the internet, uh, can these technologies be used in illicit ways? Yes, and certainly we saw the early days of the internet and people called for bans of the and internet. And to be clear, the current days of the internet as well. Mm. Oh, yeah, I guess, yeah. Well, although <laughs> there was a much louder, uh, a higher decibel level call in, the, in maybe the 90s when people were, yeah. I think, more intimidated by how these technologies are being used. And I think we're seeing that play out in the world of blockchain as well. I thought it was interesting you described the UAE uh, regulatory as light touch. You said it was I, described as light touch. Oh, described as light touch, all right. I, I actually give huge credit to the UAE. Do you have a VARA license? It, no, we do not. Although uh, we might, I, I don't know the exact answer to that, but we do not currently. The point I would make, though, is. Uh, you do not. Thank you. <laughs> the, the point I would make, though, is the UAE has done the work to codify what the regulations are. I think the challenge, you know, and we discussed this before we got up here, I think the vast majority of players in the crypto space want to be good actors. But I think we have to be clear about what that means. And I think one of the challenges is, and I very much agreed with something the commissioner said, we talk about regulating crypto. I think we should, that's an abstract thing to say to, from my point of view. We need to regulate the, the activity. What is it that we're doing? So Ripple is in the business around cross-border payments. Our customers are banks. Our customers are regulated institutions. You can't have a non-KYC, know your customer yeah. transaction, et cetera. Uh, there are lots of regulations around payments, like know your customer, like AML, anti-money laundering, like OFAC compliance in the United States, et cetera, anti-terrorism finance. So I, I think when we say crypto is not regulated, I hear that and I think, I don't know what that means. Like Ripple is a very regulated company in lots of different jurisdictions, not yet in UAE perhaps. Uh, although I don't think we, I don't know the exact status in the UAE. Uh, the, the, the point as much as anything, I think it's a misnomer to s describe crypto as an unregulated business. In the US, you have in the SEC, someone at the chair saying it's the Wild West. Look, there are clearly examples where that's true, but there are a lot of people doing solving real problems for real customers and taking the air and the froth out of the hype and speculative bubble that really was true in crypto, I think is really healthy. I think one of the challenges here is there are actually very few people describing crypto as an unregulated business. What they're saying is that it is insufficiently regulated and that there are certain types of activities, you know, separate out the obvious and egregious fraud, scram fraud scams and grift, but there are certain types of ex activities that are either being presented to customers as potentially safer than they are, or, you know, the, the promise of guaranteed returns when there are no such thing. Or in the US, for instance, um, many investors in certain of these crypto companies, several of which have now gone bankrupt, were under the impression that their deposits were insured by the FDIC, which is that up to $250,000 of whatever the deposits were would be protected. And that was an impression that was in a lot of ways encouraged by the marketing and the advertising of certain types of these entities. But we have laws about that, right? And, th and, and now, oh, well, frankly, I think instead of going after Kim Kardashian for promoting a- That case was you know, dismissed. But <laughs> I didn't actually know that. Uh, I, I think we, to, the things you're describing, and even we talked to, again backstage, like if there's fraud, we have laws about that uh, in major but jurisdictions. But I think what I would love to get the perspective of the commissioner on is, that, it is not always just explicitly fraud. Sometimes it's just misrepresentation. Or in fact, you know, something I hear very often, which crypto folks like to say was like, well, do your own research. Like it's a very easy thing to tell a venture capitalist with a team of people who are supposed to be good at this to do your own research. And it's a very different thing for a 17 year old who's being advertised at on, you know, Super Bowl advertising, for instance, um, to make informed decisions. <laughs> I think we need to step back a little because if you look at the origins of crypto, whatever we call it, asset or liability, some, I think many would have set out on the basis that they did not want to be part of the establishment mm -hmm. and therefore did not want to be part of the I, I traditionally that. regulated sector. That feeling has not gone away, you know. Uh, I think some do understand the need for regulation. So I think we're still in that battlefield of uh, those who believe that crypto and everything around it is the future and that, dare I say, central banking and monetary policy and all those things are the present but not the future. And we have to have that public conversation. Mm -hmm. And we haven't had that. So we have two, in my view, there are two groups, really. There are those who still hold to this future that they can create uh, but haven't quite described what it will look like. 
and those who understand that you need to be part of the system, of the regulatory uh, system. Now, you're right in saying that uh, the activity of some of these should be impacted by other pieces of legislation. With crypto, because nobody can see it, it's kind of an invisible thing. It's, it's, it's just gone, it has, if you like, gotten away with more before regulation um, has actually been put in place. Because not all of crypto is bad, but certainly not all of it is good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think we also need to, to say, as we sometimes with the Digital Euro proposal, we need to be able to communicate what is the value of crypto today, where will it lead us tomorrow, and had we not put some regulation in place, how much worse could this be? Um, because there's a bigger, it's, it, there's more of a societal issue around this as well. If I, and I do listen a lot, I talk a lot too, but I try and listen. There are two different camps around the financial system. There are those of us who are older, not wiser, but older, and know a system. And there are those younger, um, tech savvy, different outlooks on finance, different outlooks towards assets. And we need to make sure that there isn't a mismatch completely here. Um, in one sense, we are, I suppose, the traditional regulators. Um, I would like to think we regulate in a way to help those who see a vision for the future. But they haven't, in my view, articulated that vision beyond some believing, as the taxi driver told me, his son had millions in Bitcoin. Oh, the There's when I worry. Uh, so, so in one sense, we have to have the public discussion. The recent events have allowed this discussion to at least start, um, but it's maybe not always taking place in the forums that need to hear it. Um, so I still think there are those who believe that crypto is the future and that it doesn't need regulation. And we have to fight against that, not because we want to trap them or restrict, but it is because when there is a problem, and I say when, who will be asked to tidy up if it's a big problem? The traditional system will. Your Excellency, in, you have shared stats in the past that something like more than 20% of the population of the UAE holds an, at least one NFT and that 35% of the people there own crypto. You know, folks in the UAE or at least with KYC addresses in the UAE were identified as being among like the top creditors to Sam Bankman-Fried's FTX International. And how do how are you kind of squaring this reality of you have a population that is pretty exposed, especially on a global scale, to this asset class with the need for investor protection, education, regulation, all of the things that we're discussing here? So um, it's the first that I hear of some of those statistics. But um, the reality of the matter is I, I read an article about 4% of um, those who were affected by the FTX scandal were based in the UAE. And I actually started to dig into this to try to understand where this number came from. The, the first thing that was clear to me is there are other jurisdictions that had higher percentages, whether it was South Korea or the UK or, um, you know, um, other the countries Bahamas. around the world. The Bahamas was the highest, I think. But um, the other thing is, how do you actually understand what this means? Does this mean that there was KYC done on that person mm -hmm. or that the address was just something that people thought was in the UAE? Second, is did it, ha did it have a dollar or a thousand dollars? Because actually assessing the value of the impact is as important as un understanding where people are being impacted. And was that account active or inactive? Maybe these accounts were just, you know, domicile accounts that did not really move. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, our job as regulators is always to try to be proactive and to protect people as much as we can whenever people adopt a technology. We have a young population, so naturally, we need to ensure that we move faster than others because a young population is going to be embracing of technology. Mm -hmm. The third thing is, we actually looked at this technology I wanted to understand, other than crypto, where can it be used? Is it something that we need to invest in from a talent perspective or not? What we aim to be is the highest talent per capita country on Earth and bringing Web3 talent, bringing talent that's working on, on block blockchain technologies. Can I ask you to define Web3? So, so Web3, I think, is the future of the internet. It's the convergence of the metaverse, it's the convergence of blockchain technology. And I think um, some of the features of Web3 is quite exciting. So I think if you actually think about blockchain and the traceability behind it and the fact that all transactions are actually transactions that are legit and cannot be removed or, or erased is a positive thing for the world. It's easier for you to trace someone who has transacted through Bitcoin, for example, than cold hard cash, right? If they bought drugs or if they did you know, something that is in terrorism financing or money laundry as well. The challenge is there are some cryptos that are shady. Um, and you know, we know this and we need to regulate against this. But we are going through an evolution process. 
our job as a government is first to work with everyone necessary to ensure that people are protected across geographies mm -hmm. because this is a currency that lives on the internet. It does not live in the UAE, it does not live in the UK, it does not live in the Bahamas. The second is we need to ensure that we are agile with our policies because there are going to be bad actors trying to always play around with the legislations and the rules that we put in place. And third is we need to protect the talent because there are some really talented people in the space that we want to embrace. And I think them calling the UAE home is definitely a positive thing. Now, um, when you talk about people, you know, 30% or 20% hold NFTs, I actually don't understand how we can calculate this number. If it's just the wallet addresses, one person can have five wallets or 10 wallets. So it can be one person holding most NFTs, and people think that 20% of the population have So I want to I want to pull on that point, and, and you know, Chair, I want to ask you this question, which is, on the one hand, you have this tension between the idea that if you use Bitcoin five years ago, we could figure out if you bought drugs with it. And on the other hand, we don't know who owns NFTs. Um, how, as a regulator, are you thinking about this simultaneously of this profusion of, in, of information and kind of like an absence of context and knowledge in understanding what is a legitimate activity and what's illicit, as you described it earlier? Well, <laughs> that's quite a difficult uh, distinction to make. I mean, it, of course, these activities don't have huh, illicit yeah, or it's legitimate... It's not like labeled label, bad label, stuff. Label, <laughs> ...labeled on it. Uh, so I think there are separate authorities uh, that that sort of have to oversee uh, and, and make sure uh, that uh, anti-money la uh, anti -money laundering is being uh, prosecuted, etc. Uh, there are different privacy authorities that uh, have to take uh, sort of a close watch on, uh, on, on, on whether or uh, whether the data standards are actually uh, upheld, uh, etc. But you cannot expect all of that from uh, traditional financial uh, financial regulators. But I would say, therefore, there is also a responsibility of the industry. I mean, if there is an industry with good and bad guys, you cannot just, being a good guy, uh, sort of look at the regulators and say, oh, it's your job to sort of wield out the bad guys. And yeah, well, that there are also bad guys is not my case. No, I think you also have a collective, I think, responsibility within the industry and to make sure uh, that you don't legitimize the activities of the bad guys, if you, even if you are convinced, which you probably are, that you are a good guy within, uh, within this industry. So you cannot expect public authorities to solve all these problems. Uh, Brad, let's talk about crypto Twitter for a second, because we have to. Um, and I actually want to talk about the UAE, because let's say that you are a person who ran a hedge fund and then blew it up um, expensively and extravagantly. Why is your first point of call like Dubai, right? Like, why are, why are folks who are emerging as people in crypto who are very influential, who are very critical of other actors in the space, trying to align themselves with certain regulatory jurisdictions. And, you know, Brad, I'm going to ask you this first, and I'm going to ask for His Excellency's opinion, is, is there, in fact, a self-policing mechanism for the crypto industry when so many of these folks seem to have more than nine lives, certainly, and the ability to try to fundraise again while in active litigation with various governments? <laughs> I, I, I guess my comment and reaction there is only what I've read. You know, I saw this week that the Three Arrows Capital guys are raising a distressed crypto debt fund. That, that made me scratch my head a little bit. Uh, look, I, again, I, I think about this as an analogous to, okay, when a hedge fund blows up, Bertie Madoff, uh, we should look at, okay, what, what went wrong there? Why didn't we see that coming? I think what happened with FTX we, is, is a, a very, very similar and very analogous to what happened with Madoff. Well, Sam bankman fried has denied all allegations. I know. Him. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I, allegedly. I, don't, I know nothing proprietary of consequence here. Uh, I think it's important that we are regulated, for sure. The, the point that I was making is I think the activity is what typically has been regulated. Regulating technologies is a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Understanding how a technology is being used to touch a business, to touch a consumer, to touch fill in blank, we should absolutely have laws around that and we should protect consumers. I, I'm actually intrigued by your thought around kind of the self policing uh, mechanisms. And, I, you know, as you said it, I was thinking about, you know, how, how could we do a better job of that? You know, and frankly, one of the things that came to my mind is I think, you know, the, several people in the hedge fund industry had reported Madoff time and time again to the SEC and for whatever reason they didn't investigate. I do think, you know, we do work with law enforcement at Ripple and we do file suspicious activity reports. And, 
you know, again, we're only working with regulated endpoints, uh, so we're somewhat unique. And I will say, I agree with you that the origins of crypto were absolutely anti-government, anti-bank. Yep. You know, the, the origins of these technologies and how these technologies can be used can be very, very different. And as time goes by, I think we spend less time talking about Mt. Gox and Silk Road and more time talking about the, the real enterprise scaled use cases where it's not an experiment. You're talking about billions and billions of dollars going through Ripple's technology platform. Can and I just can I touch add upon to this that? for a second? Sorry, because I, I think know, you mentioned I something you about Dubai and <laughs> I just want to say something here. Uh, so if you look at Sam Bankman fried um, an American citizen living in the Bahamas, most of the money that was invested to promote FTX was you know, to name a stadium uh, in Miami or, or in the US, uh, spent in the US mostly, and I think he just visited the UAE uh, once. All right? uh, what happens is today you have a brand name, Dubai Sells, I think any article that says Dubai actually gets read, and it being a city that loves the future and flirts with the future you know, time in, time out with every technology, whether it's 3D printing, whether it's AI and so on and so forth, makes people assume that you know, it's where the future is. Now, if we look at every single disaster in the crypto space, Do Kwan from Luna in South Korea, he has not come to Dubai. I actually read an article saying that he was in Dubai and I went out and looked for him and the guy wasn't there. <laughs> three, three Arrows Capital was in Singapore. So the fact of the matter is, we have to differentiate that bad actors don't have a nationality and they don't have a destination. They do have lots of passports, though. Uh, maybe they do, but, but the, fact, uh, the fact is, what bad actors want to do is they want to ensure that they affiliate themselves with, let's say, jurisdictions that people feel protected in. So you hear Singapore, you hear London, you hear you know, Dubai, because people give that brand a certain amount of credibility. But uh, I don't think they have a nationality. I don't think they have a destination. You will see them everywhere. You will see them in the Bahamas. You'll see them in New York. You'll see them in London. And what we need to do as governments is to work together with the industry as well to ensure that if someone does something wrong, he can't move from one place to the other. And that's something that we take very seriously. We also need to make sure that this mistake does not get repeated. Because what's the use of us, whether Sam bankman fried turns out to be innocent or guilty, if someone else comes in and does the exact same thing in another jurisdiction, we all fail as governments. This is a lesson that we need to take today and make sure it does not get repeated tomorrow. And this segues to your point that you and other colleagues here on various stages have made that global coordinated regulation is the key. Yeah, and I wanted to add, huh, I mean, about this libertarian sort of origin, huh, this anti-establishment, we should not forget that a lot of financial transactions are based on trust. Right? Yeah. I mean, and stability is coming from the fact that we see each other as repeated game players. I can screw you today, but maybe I need you tomorrow, right? So maybe I won't screw you today because I need you tomorrow. One of the problems I have with the crypto business <laughs> is that many participants see this as a one-shot game. It's entirely and that's single sort of the highest achievement mm. is that if I screwed you to the max, right? And that in my view, is a, a sort of mentality issue, which is very difficult to regulate. It's a mentality issue, but it will imply that it will be very difficult to ever sort of create a basis of trust. And financial contracts, we know, can never be complete. So there is always a trust element needed at the end to make it work from a longer term perspective. Not an analogy you all might have been expecting. Um, we will have some time for questions, so if you do have a question, please put a hand up, and I am going to enforce the question, not a comment rule, and please do stand once we give the mics to you. Um, one of the things I always ask as a journalist is, at the end of an interview, is, is there anything I didn't ask you? And so... I have a question for you. Go, bring it on. Do you hold crypto? No. I have a question for the audience. Who would admit they hold crypto? Great. Wow. So Nothing to be for the folks on, um, it's about 50%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah more. Okay. As a financial journalist, yeah, we, we have very strict higher. rules yeah. about not owning assets that you yeah. cover. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Ayr Guernica. I run a company called Chainalysis. Um, I just wanted to, to comment a little bit of, of, of what I saw up here because there was definitely a lot of statements that I know factually are wrong. The Can amount of criminal, criminal activity on the blockchain today and in the crypto space is counted in basis points. 0 0.25 basis points. Yeah. It's a very, very small amount. In, in dollar amounts, it's a big number, but in, in, in actual amounts, it's very, very small. And I think that's an important thing to stress. What is your question? So, <laughs> it was a correction here. I would say my, my question around things here is like, what have, you, what have you done in terms of like educating and learning about crypto 
from uh, an oversight point of view. Another thing that was mentioned by Commissioner McGuinness was, was around uh, crypto was invisible. If you work a lot with, with different analytics companies like ours, you will learn that there's a lot of things you can see in crypto, and it, it, it is almost to the point where you can actually see specific transactions assigned to specific activities. So what have you done in terms of like educating yourself in, in terms of that? Thank you for the question. What is your re what do you read? <laughs> uh, well, what first of other all, than Bloomberg, obviously. No, 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 no. I, I mean, first of all, everything we do within the FSB, I repeat that we consult, right? So we sort of yeah, initiate uh, consultative comments um, in order actually to uh, educate ourselves. At the Netherlands Bank, I can add, we tried also to build uh, a crypto coin ourselves for sort of internal transactions within the bank, and the reason was only because indeed we wanted to learn by actively uh, also engaging uh, in the industry, so what the technology was about, sort of, uh, and, and I think we also learned a lot uh, from, uh, from actually doing that. And one of the things is that the benefits of this technology are beyond any doubt. I mean, nobody is questioning it. It's the use of the technology that is raising all, uh, all these issues. The numbers you gave on the criminal activity, uh, I mean, I cannot give you any other numbers. But I can tell you that if you talk to public prosecution officers, they give you a quite a different impression than from the numbers that you just mentioned. Question? Uh, this person in the third row. Thank you so much. Don. Uh, yeah, Don Tapscott. I chair the Blockchain Research Institute. And my question is for Brad, but anyone else. Um, why do we misunderstand what crypto is? In a lot of these conversations, we assume it's some kind of security, it's a new asset class, but we're digitizing, tokenizing all assets. So if you understand that, you'll understand that there are a dozen different types of which what you're talking about is one. We're tokenizing carbon credits. Should we regulate that? We're tokenizing art. Should we regulate that? There are protocol tokens that enable people in a decentralized community to communicate with each other and to make decisions. So if I understand the question, it's should we, well, if I may rephrase the question, there is often a conflation of crypto equals everything that can right. be defined as you know, stable coins versus non-backed assets or protocol tokens or the tokenization of other forms of financial assets. What, in, from a regulatory perspective, are the next steps here, given that when we talk about an asset class, an industry, or an ecosystem, it's actually multiple, or can be perceived as multiple different asset classes? Well, I, I, I mean, Don pointing the question at me, I, I'll just say, I think one of the hardest parts for the people up here doing their jobs and all the people in the respective regulatory bodies is actually understanding new technologies at a degree of detail that, it, it, to Don's point, it's very difficult to paint all of crypto with one broad brush. You have represented here, you know, where the leading stable coins in Circle, uh, you know, Chainalysis, Michael's company, you know, these are very successful, very robust companies doing very interesting things in a very regulated way. And I think the challenge for us, maybe that, that group of people, is there's so much, you know, FUD. There's so much misinformation. Fair uncertainty and doubt. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You got them all. Uh, I think it, it makes it very difficult. And I actually think we, the industry, have done ourselves a disservice by being exceptionally tribal and kind of the infighting within crypto has actually made it even harder to, uh, to, to the chair's point to, about to understand the, 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 the different <laughs> pieces and parts. And look, that's why I'm here. That's why yeah. I come to Davos. That's why I'm meeting with regulators uh, because I want to partner and say, here's how Ripple approaches this, here's how we see the industry. And I will say, I've found an amazingly receptive audience here in Davos. If I may, just to the two questions, because the first one is, do not worry, it is not all in my head, <laughs> but I have plenty of experts and they do know this area very well. Uh, we don't sit in a room, we listen to industry and we reach out. Um, and the European Parliament is involved and the member states are involved, so a lot of work goes on in this. So just to reassure you, don't worry, it's not me. Uh, to your point, to the more bigger point, I think the problem with this conversation is we have assumed there's good actors and bad actors. Mm -hmm. Good people make mistakes too. 
I mean, the bad ones are, are criminal. They're bad if they were in the traditional banking or financial system. So they're just bad and they're everywhere. And they will always be with us, tragically. But we need to find ways of getting at them. The regulation also has to deal with the good who can make mistakes or things go wrong or because they're so excited about this evolution, they don't think that they need to have constraints put upon them. Um, and I think we do need to make that difference or separation uh, because, as I understand it, some of what's happened in this area should be um, controlled by existing legislation, mm -hmm. traditional legislation. So, you know, things, uh, accounting rules, etc., are accounting rules and you shouldn't um, kind of fudge around them. Uh, so it isn't about good and bad but it is about how you also regulate those with very good intentions who make mistakes. And the reason we do that is so that their mistakes aren't massive mistakes before we discover them and we have financial instability, because then you will come to the European Commission or central bankers or whatever and say, you failed in your work. For now, people don't really want us involved because it's all very exciting, or it was up until a few months ago, and now there's a realisation we will have to either pin blame on somebody if we don't regulate effectively, or indeed say, well done, you saw this coming, and you put in place a bedrock of regulation which needs to be global. So when I'm in the US, I talk to colleagues saying, look, it's not enough for Europe to do what we're doing or others. Everyone needs to be in this same space because there are no borders and no barriers to crypto. Um, one more question over here. Maybe two, if you keep it short, no pressure. Mm -hmm. um, hello, Irshad from the Global Shippers community. Um, so I, th I mean, me myself being in Web3 space, right, like I do notice that when you talk about trust, you know, I think if you look at the issue of FTX, it's always a centralized exchange. You know, my, my, my question is, like, what are the regulators' thoughts and opinions in regards to decentralized finance where, you know, codes are immutable, permissionless and stuff like that? Where do you think that fits in in the regulatory space? Thank you. I would like the perspective of His Excellency on DeFi. Well, um, honestly speaking, I think that this space is evolving. The DeFi space is evolving. There, is a, there are a lot of questions. Um, you know, I do hear from some that it's a bubble. Because the thing about um, lending and borrowing um, is that it's a very intricate matter. And some issues that we're seeing in the DeFi space is at times you're lending a dollar the same way you're lending a million dollars. The checks and balances, the steps required are actually nearly the same. But if you go to a conventional bank and you want a million dollars, the guarantees that you need to put in place are much higher than if you want to take a dollar, right? Um, what we're going to see is, and, and I think that probably, unfortunately, we are going to see some uh, bubbles in the DeFi space in the coming future that will require a lot of government intervention. If you look at the broad crypto space, I think DeFi probably is the least regulated today, and it has a lot of applications that need to have government oversight. So we don't want to jump into, into it right now. What we're doing is we're putting the broad frameworks of regulating crypto, and then we're going to take each vertical on its own. So NFTs are different to DeFi, are different to, let's say, security tokens, are different to stable coins. The only issue that we have, if you look at the UAE government's capabilities, we can move very fast. But if we work with every other government that is interested in this, and we work as a team, so one government says, OK, we're going to approach DeFi to, to ensure that we have a baseline of regulation that's agreed upon by everyone. And we're going to bring this to the table and we can all scrutinize it the same way that we're seeing you know, the commissioner or his excellency uh, uh, you know, not doing as well in Europe. We need to be doing this for every single vertical because unfortunately we can't wait for the next catastrophe. Uh, we're already too late. I would like to ask if there are any people who are not dudes in the audience who have a question. I would love to hear from you. <laughs> OK, well, then I'll ask the final question. Um, we're going into 2023 in a, I wouldn't say historically high interest rate environment, but certainly a higher interest rate environment than before. And that has been the thing that has been attributed by lots of extremely knowledgeable macroeconomic co commentators about having contributed to removing a lot of the speculative froth from the market and you know, bringing a sense of discipline back. 
The flip side to that is if we do start to normalize rates again or rates start to go, go down, do you expect that the level of enthusiasm, shall we say, that we saw from 2020 to 2022 could potentially return? Or are there other factors at play that may be depressing some of the excitement here? Just a... Is that a crypto question or a Tesla stock question? <laughs> it is a crypto question. I have no opinions on Elon Musk. I, I'm only asking that question. I think you know, we have appropriately talked about there was obviously a, a significant decline in the value of the crypto asset market overall. If you just, you know, about $2 trillion of value went out. If you just look at Tesla, Facebook, and Amazon, $2 trillion went out last year. No one's saying we shouldn't invest in Tesla, Amazon. Actually, some for, analysts are definitely okay, saying not to invest in Tesla, Facebook, and Amazon. <laughs> and look, gotcha. it, it, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but I don't think we're trying to regulate in saying that we shouldn't let people invest in Tesla. In, yeah. I, look, I agree that the consumer protection has to be paramount. And it has to start. I, I, some of the times I hear things, I'm like, well, wait a minute, $2 trillion came out of the crypto market, but a whole lot more than that came out of The thing uh, is the assets. overall crypto market had a maximum capitalization of $3 trillion. So it represents a much larger percentage of the whole. And that's why I use Tesla stock, because Tesla stock was down the same amount as the crypto market. Well, thank you, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this. <laughs> <Take care. laughs>